So I feel like, um, who needs some good news? I feel like now's the time when we could all really use you know, like some good news. I, I think that, that there's a lot going on in the world today that feels like really bad and really heavy and really hard. There's a lot of pressures with COVID. There's a lot of pressures with going back into another lockdown. There's not a lot of pressures with, with coming, thinking that we were gonna come out of a lockdown and not. I mean, I'll tell you a story about myself. Last Sunday, I drove away from here, and as I was driving, I was cruising around in my 1998 Datsun Ferosa, and I was crossing the bridge, leaving Pinelands, and I just, it's just this, this heaviness just settled on me. I just felt heavy. I was like, man. And that's the moment that I realized that I actually had expectations. I had expectations that this, this level of lockdown would be done. You know, in my mind, I thought, okay, we're going to go, we're going to cut back to, to, to having no one in the room. Then we're going to be able to have 50 people in the room. And then a couple weeks after that, we're going to go back to where we can have 100 people in here and be at half capacity everywhere else. And there was so much good and so much momentum. And there were so many amazing things that were happening. And then it kind of was all put on pause. And I realized that I had an expectation that that would be done by now. And so as I drove over the bridge heading home, I thought, like, okay, why do I feel heavy? Why is, why is this heavy? Well, it's because I had an expectation. And today's message is not on expectations. But what I want to invite you guys to be okay with is it, it can, it's okay for life to feel heavy right now. Because a lot of jobs are being impacted. A lot of things are being impacted. I mean, you can't even make certain decisions for yourself without everyone else weighing in on it and that being an impact. There's political impact, there's social impact, there's cultural impact, there's, there's all kinds of things that are pressing on us, and we just, I, I just know that I'm not the only person that's taken on a little bit of heaviness, that's taken on a little bit of weight. You know, this, this week, we've, we had a hard week as a church this week. You know, as a church, we, we spent time praying with some of our, our church families, many people that you guys know, that, you know, have really been hit hard with COVID, and they're in the hospital, and it's like, man, we were just having prayer calls and prayer sessions and praying for healing, and then watching God come through and watching God heal and watching God do things. But in the midst of that, I was on a, a Zoom call while people were praying over a family, and I just, you know, I turned my camera off, and I turned my mic off, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm just absolutely astounded at the amount of hope and faith and peace that these families carried. It wasn't my family member on the line. It was theirs that was on the line. And I just could not imagine the level of peace and hope that they still had. I mean, it was humbling for me. And so I come into today's message, and I, I want to I give us some good news. Not, not only for you guys, and not only for our people online, I, I, want, I want you to have some good news, and I want to give me some good news. So everything that I'm saying today, I'm saying not only for your benefit, well, I hope it's a benefit, but I'm also saying for my benefit. And for me, the best news that I know, the best thing that I know that I can talk about, the best thing I know we can learn about is Jesus. Jesus is the good news. And if you're a Christian, you know that. You've heard that. You've grown up with that. But if you're not a Christian, if, if, this isn't, if this isn't part of your normal daily kind of thing or your daily thinking, I just want you to know that, that the good news of Jesus is also available for you. And so we started a journey last week, and we're, we're going to continue on that journey. And this journey, it could not have been timed any better. In, in my little itty-bitty mind, months ago when I was building the, the sermon series and building the schedule of what I was going to talk about, I, there's no way that I would have known where we would be today. But I'm so thankful that God used my itty-bitty brain to pick a set of messages, to pick a journey for us to go on that would bring good news in a time like this. And so, as I sat here over the weekend, kind of rewriting and reworking and rethinking about this message, I, I went home last night and I told Casey, I was like, I just don't, I still don't know what to say. And as I examined my heart and I continued to pray about it, I was like, man, we just need good news. We need good news. And the nice thing is, is we have the best news possible for us. And so today, we're going we're gonna to read a couple passages. We're going to talk about some scripture, and we're going to find the good news of Jesus in that. And this journey that we're on in this series is we're on a journey of getting to know Jesus. See, we talked about it last week. It's not fair when we form an opinion about somebody, and we don't actually know that person. 
It's, it's not fair for us to say, to be critical of somebody and not know them. And so what I want to make sure that we get to do is that we get to form an opinion on Jesus based on who he actually is. I want us to actually get to know Jesus. And we talked about that last week, and it, we, we came away with these four points last week, which is just so beautiful because it just completely encapsulates just the, the, the kind of heavenly father that, that loves us and that died on the cross for us. And so we're going to look back. I'm going to do a quick review, and then we're going to jump into this week. And so the first thing we talked about last week was this. Being a, dis- a sinner does not disqualify you. It's actually a prerequisite. So for everyone out there, just know if you're a sinner, you can still follow Jesus. So what does that tell us about Jesus? That tells us that Jesus loves sinners. Raise your hand if you're a sinner. I, everybody. I can't see everybody, but my wife's taking notes in the back. Make sure you, everyone put their hand up. No, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. That's the whole point of some of Jesus' sermons. It was, was hey, I, I want everyone to know that they're a sinner, and that means that everyone needs me. And so you can come to me as a sinner, and I'm there for you because I came for the sinners. So we all have to be sinners. The second point that we talked about last week was that being an unbeliever does not disqualify you from Jesus. And, and this was, to me, was kind of crazy because it was most of Jesus' followers actually did not believe in him. They, they thought he was maybe a rabbi or a teacher. And even those that thought he was a Messiah, when he died and he was in the tomb, they thought, okay, my Messiah is dead. The, now it's just a rabbi in the tomb. And it was only when he resurrected and showed himself to the, the disciples that they believed. So guess what, guys? Jesus is so good, we didn't even have to believe. We, we, we can still follow Jesus. And the third thing that we learned was, was this, that the invitation to follow is purely an invitation of relationship. Jesus just wants relationship. And, and we know that because religion asks us to change in order to join it. But Jesus says, join me, and then you will change. So Jesus was so confident in who he was that we don't have to do anything that we need to do. There's nothing we need to do to come to Jesus. We can just come to Jesus. Jesus is like, you just come to me and spend time with me, and you'll change. I promise. I know you'll change. And then the last characteristic that we learned about Jesus is following Jesus forces me to focus on where I am instead of where you're not. The beautiful thing there that you can just set yourself free on is that, is that it doesn't matter what someone else's prayer life is or someone else's prayer life isn't. What matters is just who you are and your relationship with Jesus. It doesn't matter what your neighbor's doing and what your friend's doing, or it doesn't matter what you think a Christian should be. It's, this is between you and Jesus, and you can come as you are. Now, you would think that when I left last week after hearing that message, after preaching that message, that I would have not felt so heavy crossing the bridge leaving Pinelands, but I did. I still felt heavy. And fortunately, we, we're, today we're going to dig into a story that's going to reveal more of Jesus' character to us. And it's going to talk about some of the things that we're struggling with. And, and as we do that, I just want to invite you to just get to know Jesus. Because as we get to know Jesus, there's good news for us. And after deciding what I was going to say today, I woke up this morning excited knowing that there was good news for us today. And so if it works in my heart, I trust and believe that it'll work in your heart. And so we're going to start in Matthew. So there, this story is told in two, in two Gospels. So Jesus has an account written about him in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Matthew's account, that when he wrote it, he was an eyewitness to Jesus, and he primarily wrote for the Jewish people. So his account is really short. It's really like concise. There's not a, lot of, uh, a ton of details there because he knew that, that the people that he was writing to kind of had an understanding of what was going on. And so we're going to read a passage in Matthew, and we're going to pick a few things from that, and then we're going to go to the same passage in Luke. Now, Luke was a doctor. Luke was really into details. He was very detail-oriented, and he wrote his book for the purpose of the Gentiles, which is like us. So Luke writes for the rest of us so that we can understand more of what's going on in the story. And so let's turn here to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, or sorry, Matthew chapter 4. And and I'm just going to read, we're going to read this story together. And it says this, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, 
he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. So Jesus sees these two guys fishing. And then the next verse here says, Jesus says, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. So if you read this with like a critical mind, it's kind of like um, we were taught not to follow strangers growing up, um, but it actually gets even worse here. So in the next verse, Jesus says, so he's going on from there. So he's kidnapped, I mean, recruited two people. And then now he goes on to two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So does that mean that they, like, jumped? I don't know if that means they jumped off the boat. I don't know if they swam. I don't know if it was like, Dad, I'm out of here. I'm gone. But the, the point to Matthew's story is if you read this story and you take it at face value, it leaves you thinking... It, I hope it were to leave you asking, like, is this a spiritual question or is this an irresponsible question? Is this, is this story about me being spiritual or is this just like a crazy, irresponsible kind of fluke thing that happened in the Bible? So, like I said, the, we were taught not to, not to go with strangers. We had a funny story in our house happen the other day. There's an ice cream guy that drives around Rhonda Bosch in Pinelands. And he plays this very loud megaphone. And him and I have a horrible relationship together because I hate the sound of that megaphone. I hate the, the, the sound of the music. And so when we lived in Pinelands, one day he came down our street. And as he was coming down our street, I went outside. I think I used the baby sleeping as an excuse. Anyone else do that? Like, hey, my baby's asleep. Can you please turn your music down or, you know, this, <laughs> that down? And he, was, he wasn't asleep. But I went outside, said, hey, man, turn that thing off. And we just developed a, a negative relationship. And then we moved to Rhonda Bosch. And guess what? I hear a couple weeks ago that same music, that megaphone. And I went outside and I just stared and we eyeballed each other and he did not turn it down. So he's following me. I'm trying to remember that I'm supposed to be a pastor and not think horrible thoughts about this guy as he's trying to make money from his broken down van uh, with ice cream. So... I think something happened. I don't remember if Leafa got ice cream or didn't get ice cream, but I think Leafa actually saw the inside of this ice cream van at some point, and he brought up how nasty it was and this and that and how many just wrong things were going on in there. And, and my wife says, yeah, and, and Alvin, they used to sell drugs out of those things. And, and I thought, <laughs> Leafa was like, wait, what? Yeah, they'd drive around. The ice cream truck would be the front for, like, drug sales. But growing up, we were taught stranger danger. So you never go up to a strange ice cream truck, or you never follow someone that says, hey, let me just come, come this way. Let me just show you some puppies that I have for him. And that's how kids get kidnapped. And we're to, we, we were taught not to do that. But if you look at spiritually, are we taught to do the same thing? See, what happens is, is that preachers and churches and pastors, they take this scripture that we just read in Matthew, and they twist it a little bit. And so when you read it in Matthew, it's, it, it, it's maybe preached to you. It's like, immediately drop your nets and go follow Jesus. Immediately, wherever you are, have faith. Put your faith in Jesus. Go and be a fisherman of men. It's, it's don't ask questions. Just go follow. Don't, don't, don't do anything. Just leave your father. Leave your family. Jump off the boat and go follow Jesus. And that sometimes is what we're taught. And what happens when we're taught that is we're taught a misrepresentation of Jesus. And when we pick up this misrepresentation of Jesus, we end up carrying around with us these expectations that can never actually be met. So instead, we're thinking, hey, when hard things come in life, I've just got to have just faith. I've just got to go and just follow Jesus. I'm just going to quit my job and follow Jesus. You know what? Maybe that's not the right thing to do. Because as we dig into this story, we find out that that's not actually the heart of Jesus. Now, I'm not trying to discredit the, anything that Matthew said, because what Matthew wrote was true. It was factual, but he wrote it to a specific audience. So there's a few details that we're going to pick up when we look at Luke. But before we learn about who Jesus is, I just wanted to make sure that we account for the fact that if you have a skewed definition of Jesus. If you have a skewed definition of what it takes to follow Jesus, what do you have to do to follow Jesus? 
If what you had to do was fought to follow Jesus was to blindly jump off the boat and go follow a random guy that walks by you and says, hey, come follow me, then I would not do that. I would say, no, that's kind of irresponsible. That's, I don't think I'm going to do that. No, thanks. I don't want to have any part of that. And that, that, fortunately for us, is not the heart of Jesus. So if anyone out there or anyone online, if any of you guys are carrying around this unnecessary weight of, man, if I could just have enough faith to just quit this or leave this or do this or move to this place or, or whatever it is, then I would, I would be considered a faithful person to Jesus because look at what happened in Matthew. And I just want to dispel that because that's not the purpose. So instead, we can look in Luke. And Luke gives us the same story. And so what I hope to do is kind of like what they do in the military, where they break you down and then they build you back up. And I just want to first break down every, every I want to break down that liar, that myth, or that misconception, that thing that takes the good news of Jesus away. And instead, I want to reveal to you the heart of Jesus as he unfolds in this story. This is an amazing story. This is a very cool story because what it does is it tells us about Jesus. It tells us about his heart. It reveals so much about his character that it's good news for us. And we need good news right now. So in Luke 5, 1, it starts off with this. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gesineret, and so this is the Sea of Galilee. It's just called differently here, but it's, it's most of Jesus' ministry happened in the, the sea, around the Sea of Galilee. And the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Okay, same as Matthew's story. But here we have a little bit more detail immediately. The people were crowding around Jesus and they were listening. What were they listening to? They were listening to Jesus as he was teaching. So what does that tell us about Jesus? Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is teaching people and they're listening to him. So there's an exchange. It's not just this random, hey, just come follow me. Okay, I quit what I'm doing. I come follow you. I don't ask questions. I don't need to learn anything. I don't need to understand anything. I don't need to question anything. I don't need to do any of that. I just need to close my eyes and tie a rope to Jesus and just blindly follow him around. But that's not, that's not actually what's happening. What is actually happening is Jesus is teaching and people are listening. There is an exchange between Jesus. He's like, hey, ask me questions. Challenge me. Dig into the word. And so we go on here. They're, they're listening to the word of God, and Jesus is, is actually teaching them what would have been the old, what we would consider now the Old Testament. So in verse 2, it goes on to say, He saw at the water's edge two boats. So foreshadowing. Remember, it was Simon and his brother Andrew were the first of the two brothers at the, at the edge of the water. So this is Simon and Andrew's boat. So we're getting more context to the story. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So what would happen is the fishermen, they would go out and they would fish all night long. So they had nets and they would, I don't know if anyone has seen people do that. It's like magic. I just go through, I can lose two hours on YouTube watching people just fish with nets because it's so magical the way it, it just spreads out and it, the way it hits the ground. It's satisfying to me. Whew, I love it. But what they would do is they would go out and they would fish at night. And when they came in in the morning, they would put their nets across these wooden pegs. And the nets would then dry. So they would go through and they would wash it. They would pick out the plastic uh, bottles. They would pick out the knick-knack wrappers uh, for any South Pointers that came from Rhodes Memorial. Uh, those days, you know all about cleaning up, you know, chicken bones in the yard and the parking lot and things like that. And they were basically doing that. So once, once they got their nets cleaned and once the nets dried, then they would roll the nets back up and then they would store them and get ready for the next night. So Jesus is standing on the side of the shore and Peter or Simon at the time and Andrew, they're, they're washing their nets. They're working. They're doing, they're doing some work. Now something that's interesting here is, is Simon, Simon and Andrew have actually already spent a year with Jesus. So if we look at another gospel, when we look at the gospel of John, we actually see that Simon and Andrew had followed Jesus as disciples for a year. And then they left Jesus' presence, and then they came and rejoined their family business as fishermen. So 
Again, that goes back to this idea that you don't even have to believe in Jesus all the way to follow him because here you have two disciples that he's about to call to him that were with him for a year and then they left. So they're like, hey, this guy's a great teacher because remember, Jesus was not G- Jesus as we know at the time. Jesus was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He was just a great teacher. And so you guys can go back a verse. I think you've skipped ahead. Go back, go back to, there we go. So he, he saw at the water's edge two boats, and they were washing their nets. So go on to the next verse. He got into one of the boats, one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. Now, why do you think Jesus got into one of the boats? I think the reason that Jesus got into one of the boats is because the ground was probably muddy. The ground was probably, you know, sopping wet being next to the sea. And you've got all these people gathered around. And so Jesus, maybe he just doesn't like standing in water. I know I hate it. I know one of the worst things about when it rains, if you're OCD like me, is when all your kids run through the yard and then they come inside and they bring all the grass and mud and everything in their house. Will, I can't imagine what your house is like on a rainy day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so Jesus is standing in the mud and he decides, you know what? I'm, I'm going to get into a boat. And so he inconveniences Peter. Or Simon at the time, he says, hey, Simon, let me get in your boat. Let me take your boat out a little bit. And see, this is where it's important that Simon wasn't a stranger to to Jesus. Because Simon had spent a year with Jesus. So when this teacher, this rabbi that he's already spent a year with and watched him do things, comes to him and says, hey, can I take your boat out? He's like, "Ah, you know, I've kind of already like started doing the nets, and I've started cleaning things up, and, and uh, okay, fine. I'll let you take the boat out. Now, something that is revealed in me, or to me, about the heart of Jesus in this part of this verse is that Jesus is always looking for a platform. See, Jesus realized that as he stood in the mud, or I'm speculating here, but maybe as he stood in the mud, as he stood next to the ocean, and people were gathering around him, maybe he realized that, that he, he couldn't reach all of them with his voice. They couldn't all see him. He needed a platform. He needed a bigger platform. He needed somewhere where, where he could actually reach out to everybody, where he could project his voice, where people could see him and they could understand him. And the amazing thing about that is that Jesus will do anything, including inconvenience others or inconvenience you, in order to have a platform to speak in a way that you learn from him. Now, how much of what we have in our life, if I continue to speculate that thread out even more, how many of us right now are being inconvenienced and we're tired of being inconvenienced, but actually what's happening is Jesus is trying to get a platform so that he can speak into your life so that you can actually hear him and understand him and learn from him. See, the the amazing thing about the God that we serve is that he's willing to do that. And so if you feel inconvenienced, if your life feels a little bit inconvenienced right now, Maybe Jesus is just looking for a platform because he wants to teach you something. He wants to show you something. So once Jesus takes the boat out, he sits down and he begins to to teach the people. And then when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now this is amazing. This is the part here where something really cool, something really special happens because Jesus Jesus has not only inconvenienced Simon and said, let me take your boat out. Now what Jesus is doing is he's saying, hey, Simon, the thing that you've done a thousand times, I want you to go and do it again. See, Simon was, was a professional fisherman. Simon was, was, was someone that he knew the ocean. He knew the lake. He knew everything that there was to know about that place and about fishing. He knew it all. So he knew it so much and he was so comfortable with it that Simon actually left following Jesus in order to go back to to the thing that he was the most comfortable doing. So again, that's something, if I pull that thread a little bit, I can say, how many of us have left following Jesus so that we can go back to do the thing that we think we're good at doing or that we're comfortable at doing? A lot of us have done that. And the amazing thing is, is even when you've done that, Jesus doesn't leave you. He doesn't give up on you. Instead, he inconveniences you. He puts himself on a platform in front of you. And then he looks at you and he tells you how to do the thing that you left him to go and do. 
So Jesus is like, hey, Simon, I know you know how to fish. I know you're amazing at fishing. This is what you do. I mean, you're so good at it. You left me so that you could fish. Cool. Hey, why don't you go out and fish right now? Now, this could be very offensive because the way fishing worked at the Sea of Galilee is it was a deep sea, and they fished at night. And the reason they fish at night is because the, the, the air temperature cooled and the surface of the water would cool down and then the fish would come up from the deep. And as the fish came up from the deep, the boats would go out and they would, they would then do that beautiful net casting thing. And, and the nets would, would sink down and they would pull the fish in. But it worked because it was at night. And it worked at night because the air cooled and the water cooled and the fish came to the surface. Now, during the day, what happened? The opposite. During the day, the air would warm up and the surface would warm up. And guess what? The fish would go to the deep. Now, Jesus, since he created the world and he knows everything there is to know about the world, he knows this is how fish work. That's why he tells them, I want you to go into the deep and put your nets out. Now, that doesn't make sense because you have a net that's designed for shallow water fishing, and he's saying, go to the deep where the water is cold because I know the fish and I know you think that the fish are going to be at the bottom in the deep. So go to the deep and fish on top of the water and that you're going to catch fish. Now, I, I can't imagine what you would say. I can imagine what I would say. Yeah, right. Come on. You're not going to tell me what to do or you're not going to tell me how to do this thing. Like I'm a professional fisherman. I know how to fish. I know what's going on here. And Peter, or Simon at the time, he gives this great response. Simon answers, Master. Now, with this, this is like him politely. Master is not Lord. Master is teacher. Master is like, okay, I spent time with you. I know you're a teacher. Master, politely trying to decline. Master, we've worked hard all night and have not caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Master, we've worked all night and have not caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, Simon doesn't know that, he doesn't know what hangs in the balance here. Simon Peter doesn't know the miracle that hangs in the balance on his decision of whether or not to go out and fish or not. He's going out to fish just because he's trying to respect Jesus as a teacher as a rabbi. But he doesn't know that what hangs in the balance is, is a relationship that would be formed between him and Jesus that would then go on not only to change his life, but would go on to change Christianity across the entire world. To Simon, all he knows is he went out and fished, and it didn't work. He brought nothing back, and now Jesus is asking him to do it again because apparently it's going to work this time. And remember, he's got to go through all that work and all that effort of pulling the nets back out and getting the boat ready and doing all of that stuff. So it's not as simple as we think, but he does it. Now, when Simon goes out, when they had done so, so when they went out and cast the nets, when they went out and fished, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they asked or so, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. So you can go to the next verse here. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. And then the next verse says, For he and all of his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Now what's happened here? is if you notice it, I don't know if you picked it up, but before Simon addressed Jesus as master, and now Simon addresses Jesus as Lord. So what happened in the transition between master and Lord? What happened between, hey, I'm just going to respect you as a rabbi, I'm going to just respect you and, and just do what you've asked me to do because culturally that's what I'm supposed to do, and now all of a sudden he comes back and he falls before him and he says, I'm a sinner and you are Lord. What happened there? Well, what happened is that Simon had an encounter Simon did the thing that, that he thought he was the best at doing, and he brought back an empty net. You know, it makes me wonder. I wonder if it was by chance, if Jesus had anything to do with the fact that maybe Simon went out and fished and brought back empty nets. I wonder if Jesus set that up for Simon. 
I wonder if Jesus was willing to make Simon's nets empty so that he could have an impact in this story because he knew he was going to do this miracle for Simon. I wonder if there, if there was something that Jesus had to do with the fact that Simon left Jesus to go do the thing that he was really good at. And so then Jesus takes the thing that Simon is really good at, which is fishing, and maybe, just maybe, Jesus lets Simon bring back empty nets. Because Jesus wants Simon to, uh, to know and he wants us to understand that, you know what, the things that we think that we're good at, th- those come from the blessings of God anyway. And, and you see here, Jesus is, is, is watching, we're watching Simon in front of Jesus have his world deconstructed and his mind just absolutely blown because, because what happens is Simon does something that he's done a million times, but he does it a little bit differently. He fishes a little bit differently. He listens to the instructions from Jesus, and he does something he's done a million times, but he does it a little bit differently. And when he does, he brings in full nets of fish, so much so that it transitions his heart from master to Lord. Jesus, you were master. Jesus, now you're Lord. Now, if I pull that thread out a little bit and I look at our lives and I look at the good news in our lives is a lot of us right now feel like we're bringing in empty nets. Last week when I drove away from the church, I felt like my net was empty. I had done everything that I knew to do. You know, we pour everything into services. We pour everything into family ministries. We put all of our blood, sweat, and tears in it. We do what we think that we know we're good at. We do all the things in this church that God's asked us to do. We do it and we give it to God, but we, we give it all that we have. And last week, the heaviness that I felt was a heaviness of an empty net. How many of us in our lives have empty nets? How many of us have expectations that have led to empty nets? How many of you, how many of you on the other side of the screens there have something in your life that you feel like the net should be full? You don't understand why the net isn't full, but the net's empty and you're pulling empty nets out of the ocean. You're coming to shore and you've got nothing to show for your work. You've got nothing to show for what you've done. That net, that empty net may just be the heaviest net or the heaviest thing that you can carry. And so what happens is Jesus intersects with us, and he fills our nets. But oftentimes, in order to do that, he brings in something that's a little bit different. He asks us to do something a little bit differently. When you look at your life and you think about, what is the thing that's not working the way that I wanted it to work? What's the thing that's not coming together the way that I wanted it to to come together? Lord, why have I lost my job? Why won't COVID uh, let go of us? Why can't we get over this? Why is there another variant that's being developed? Why, why is my boss doing this? Or why? You know, Whatever it is in your life, a lack of finances, people that have been sick, a lot of us have lost loved ones. But it's easy to look at life and feel heavy and to feel like, man, I'm doing all this work and I'm casting out the net and I'm pulling back empty nets. It's not supposed to work that way. It's dark, it's night, the air is cool, fish are supposed to come to the surface, but as I throw my net out, it comes back empty. What is going on, Lord? What is happening with this, God? Is Jesus somewhere in your life saying, hey, I want you to go out and I want you to do it this way? And are you somewhere in your life where you're saying, nah, that's not going to work? Because I'm doing it the way that it makes sense for it to work. And Jesus is standing there in your life, and he's already inconvenienced you, and he's already standing on a platform in front of you, and then he's telling you some instructions, and he's saying, hey, you know what? Do it a little bit differently. Trust me and do it differently. And the great thing about that for us is that we don't have to declare him Lord when we do it. We can just say, okay. I don't believe it, I don't think it's gonna work, but you know what, you're master, you're teacher, you're the rabbi, you're you're a whole bunch of people believe in you, so therefore, you know, I'll accept this. And then we go and do it. And when you do it, even if you do it half-heartedly, even if you don't fully believe in Jesus, I guarantee you, Jesus is gonna fill your net. Now, I don't know what he's gonna fill it with or how he's gonna fill it. It may be full of love, it may be full of acceptance, it may be full of forgiveness, it may be full of money, it may be full of family, I don't know. I don't know what your empty net is. But what I do know is that through the interaction with our Lord and Savior, 
No matter where we are or what we're doing or where we come from, our empty nets, which happens under our power, when we take control, when we do things the way we think they should be done, when we do things the way the world thinks they should be done, when we do things the way nature tells us it should be done, we can always pull in an empty net. But again, praise God because Jesus is so good and he loves us so much that he will get in the mud and teach us and let us listen to him. And then he will pick a platform in our lives so that he can speak his word to us and we can hear him even more clearly. And that's usually an inconvenience, but it's a platform. And then while he's speaking to you and he tells you what to do a little bit differently and he gives you that word, guess what? Just go do it. It doesn't make sense that you've been pulling in an empty net. What makes sense is that when Jesus enters your life and he intersects with you, your net is going to fill up. Now, I'm going to ask Jody to come out. Jody's going to, she's going to pick on the guitar, give me a little bit of background music um, while we close this thing down here. Now, I want to thank you guys for listening to me. I want to thank you guys for for just giving me an opportunity to, to be like honest with you guys and real with you guys. And I'll tell you what my empty net was. I told you my empty net last week was pulling away from here and just thinking like, man, how's the church gonna stay open? How are we gonna keep finances rolling? How are we gonna keep people coming? Like people are gonna lose interest, God. If this doesn't work out, people are gonna lose interest. If this doesn't work out, the tithe dries up. If all this happens, then we lose the building or we lose this or we lose that. Or what about all the people that God was working in their lives and they were coming to church and now all of a sudden we haven't seen them in church. There hasn't been an opportunity for them to even come to church and I've sent a WhatsApp to this person and they've not responded. I'm checking them on Facebook and they've not said anything. And now all of a sudden I'm driving across a bridge and I'm just like, man, my net is empty. It's so, so empty. And when I let Jesus have a platform in my heart, which was, was like the whole week Jesus was asking me for that platform. Hey, let me have it, let me have it, let me have it, let me have it. And I stood here on this stage on Saturday morning with my notes. I talked to myself and that's how I practice. I make sure the building's empty because if someone walks in, it'd be super weird. But I think out loud and I talk to God out loud and I process, I do all that out loud and I do it to God and it's weird and it's awkward but I do it anyway. And as I do it, I can feel Jesus nudging me. I want, I want a platform. I have a platform, Chris. I've inconvenienced you. I've made it so you don't understand this sermon. I've made it so you don't understand the message. I've made it so that you don't know what to say. But I'm trying to talk to you. And so I left, I closed up my computer and I went home and I was like, I have no, I told Casey, I said, I, I don't even know. I don't know what's gonna happen or what, I, I don't know. And I, I sat all night last night, or not all night, but I, I spent a couple hours just listening to worship music, took the dogs for a walk. And it was finally like when I let go, when I took, took my hands off the net and I just let Jesus tell me, hey, Chris, just put worship music on, just worship me. And when I did that, it's like I felt like my net came back full. And then all of a sudden I felt like, man, God is so good. And this week I've seen God move in such amazing ways, in such good ways. And no matter how hard things get or no matter what's going on, I can look back this week and I can see that God is just filling nets in this church. He's filling nets in people's lives. He's filling financial nets. He's filling relational nets. He's filling just all the needs that so many of us have. He's filling those nets. And, and, And that's just, it's amazing. So I'm so thankful that we serve a God like this. I'm so thankful that we serve Jesus. I'm so thankful that I got an opportunity this week to get to know Jesus a little better. And I hope that through this message, you guys are at least opened up to the idea of what would it be like to just get to know this creator a little bit better. He's not asking you to do anything crazy, like to quit your job and, and just blindly walk away. No, he's hey, question me, talk to me, listen to me while I teach you. Let me take the boat out. Let me have, let me have space in your life and let us interact with each other. And as that happens, I'm gonna change you. I'm gonna show you that change. I'm going to ask you to do something maybe just a little bit different. 
So I'm gonna pray for us and then while I pray, the rest of the band's gonna come out and they're gonna lead us in another worship song. And during this worship song, I just want you to think about, is Jesus, has Jesus inconvenienced you for a platform? And then what could Jesus be asking you to do a little differently, to let go of your net and let him fill your nets? So Lord, thank you so much. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are a good, good Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love when we get to know you. And thank you, Lord, that even as we slightly get to know you better, even as we slightly get to know your heart through, through what we read and what we study in your word, that, that you just change us in such a powerful way. I pray, Father, that, that this church is a church that gets to know you better and that anyone that comes through these doors, anyone that hears us online or however they come in contact with us, that, that they just get to know you. They just get exposed to your goodness a little bit more. And so, Lord, I lift up every ear that's heard this, and I just pray, Father, that you, you get on your platform in their lives and you tell them what they need to do just a little bit differently in order for you to fill their nets. In Jesus' name.